This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They, I it felt, felt I feel right. right. I was so and I just thought, well, I figured it, out. I it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hi everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This week's story is from Julian Parker. The story was recorded in October 2013 at October Gallery in London. The theme of the evening was Inside Out. You're very lucky to get me tonight because there's an awful lot of therapy in recovering from being a military intelligence officer. So I can do 10 minutes and then I'll probably have to go back on the couch. Um, My talk is is basically entitled... um, how I became a plain nerd and learned to live with my shame. Um, I, I, I haven't always been a plain nerd. Um, for the last 30 something years, you know, kids, mortgages, debts, work, more debts, more work, more kids, more mortgages, all of those things, you know, all the usual things that we have to face, uh, they, they rather did for, they did for what was a childhood obsession. Um, and if you'd met me, at age, or anything from sort of 7 to 15, I suppose, uh, it was pretty obvious that I was a plain nerd. You couldn't get into my room without smacking your head on dozens of various model planes hung up with fishing wire. There was everything there, you know, there was, there was, there were helicopters, there were, there were even airliners, which we just thought was so boring, but you had to have some. Um, (laughs) And, and there was everything, but the particular favourite for us, the the generation I grew up with, was the, uh, the Supermarine Spitfire. We just loved this. Every comic we read had it in. It was the, you know, the plane that did so much for the country in its hour of need. It was, some planes look like they shouldn't fly. You know, you look up in the sky, you see a jumbo coming in, you think, no, come on, don't kid me. How does that stay up there? Uh, helicopters as well, that's why I don't ever get in one if you get a chance. You know, they, 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 they don't look like they should fly. The Spitfire looked like it should do nothing else. If you see one on the ground, it's like, what's it doing there? It's meant to be up in the sky. We just love these things. We used to buzz around in the street outside where we lived on our bicycles, we little sort of, you know, little boys on our bicycles, weaving in and out, sort of dogfighting with each other. That's, that's, that's what we did. Uh, somebody even came out with the fantastic idea, and we thought it was fantastic, of, of using strips of cardboard and getting, a, yeah, you know this, don't you? Getting a, um, a, a clothes peg and clipping it so that when the spokes of the bikes go around, it goes pop, 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 like that. And, you know, we, j- we thought it was good enough for us anyway. It explains why none of us had girlfriends, but it was certainly good enough for us. And one day, while we were doing this, you know, buzzing around with our butt, butt, butt bikes, the, the milkman, this, this very sort of lovely white-haired old guy with a big moustache, was sitting in his milk float along the road, and he said, um, hey, boys, I've seen what you're doing. Come over here, I've got a story to tell you. Now... These were, you know, the old innocent days. These days, if a milkman said that to a load of young boys, <laughs> he'd be, be on the, definitely on the front page of the Daily Mail the next day. There's no question. But this guy was a bit... This guy told us he had been a Spitfire pilot during the Battle of Britain. This was like meeting Elvis. This was absolutely fantastic. It was like, <gasps> oh, really? And so he told us all about it. And, and then he gave us some of his books. Nobody else seemed to want them, so I took them. And I started reading these, and they, they explained how aeroplanes fly, which is pretty amazing, I think, for somebody who doesn't really get um, physics very much, um, how they fly, why they fly. So I read all the books, and I, you know, I absolutely loved this stuff. But then, come the age of 17, when you know, my dad said, well, you've got to kind of think what you want to do next, son. Um, you know, coming up to the end of school, you're going to go to university, what are you going to do? An entire life of wanting to be a pilot, for some unexplicable reason... 
it can only be military conditioning. I basically, instead of kind of turning left and getting a smart blue uniform with the wings and everything, because I look good in blue, um, I, I turn right and I join the army. I have no idea why I did that. I mean, somebody else might one day tell me, but there you go. So I joined the army, and I spent a number of years in weird and wonderful places doing strange things with, with great people um, in unpleasant circumstances. And then I left that, and I, I stumbled into all sorts of other things, like you know, I got into um, the investigation business. And I, I just completely forgot about this interest in flying. Yeah, hey, what? You know, it's kid stuff. Who cares? Well, you're like being an astronaut or a train driver. Um, but after 20 years of working for other people, be, you know, being other people's whipping boy, I thought, hang on a minute, you know, I, I reckon I can whip myself just as well as they do. And, you know, I, there'll be less shouting, and it won't hurt so much. So I founded a business with a friend. And when we were just three people strong, a, uh, a, per a client that we'd known from a previous, our previous jobs, um, a really big, this guy was very important, very, very senior sort of corporate investigator. And he said, um, he'd given us a piece of work to do. And he came to London. He said, "Right, I've given th myself three days to, to to go over all your research, everything you found for me." He said, "Yeah, yeah." Was, we were, you know, really excited. This was a big case for us. And at the end of two days, we looked at him. We said, "Yos, we're done." And he said, "Okay." We said, "Well, we, we're done. We've we've told you everything that we found out for you. You can go home." And he looked at us. Said, I, "I don't want to go home." I said, "Okay. Well, you can go shopping. You're in London." He said, "I don't like shopping." Right, um, sightseeing, I've seen all the sights. Right, okay, and I said, well, Yoss, what do you want us to do? Uh, he said, I want you to entertain me. <laughs> and I looked, and I, oh no, I mean, you know, oh, I just, my heart sank. Oh, what do we, I don't know what to do with this guy. But anyway, um, I looked at my colleague and I said, you got any great ideas? And Sam said, well, we could go to France for lunch. I said. What do you want to do that? We're in the middle of London. There's more restaurants here than anywhere else in the world. I mean, why, you know, it's probably, why are you going to France? It's a stupid idea. It'd take all day. And Sam replied, not if we flew in my plane. And that was not the answer I was expecting. And they followed this sort of rather sort of comic clown-like conversation. You know, you have a plane? Yes, otherwise I wouldn't have suggested it. You can fly it? Yes, otherwise I wouldn't have suggested flying my plane. So Jos thought this was wonderful. And we met Sam the next day. You know, he looked a bit too Top Gun for my liking. He had his leather jacket and his Ray-Bans on and everything. I, I imagined we were going to get out some massive sort of F-16 or something. And it was a very small plane. It looked, it was, it looked like a sort of 2CV with wings. like. Uh, you know. But it got us to France. And, and the way back was my undoing because on the way back, I sat in the front with Sam, and he said, you know, why don't you take the controls? <gasps> Ooh. Now, all, that year, all those years of learning how they worked, and you know, I thought, well, oh, I wonder if they do what I thought they did. And they do, strangely enough. <laughs> so, so, you know, and I, there I was. I was. I was on my bike again, you know, with the flappy cardboard thing. I mean, I just thought, this is fantastic. I love it. Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I become a pilot? What was I thinking? So um, I got home, and I thought, oh, no. My nerd life has come back. I've got a wife who doesn't think I'm a nerd. She married somebody who wasn't a nerd. I've got teenage kids. I mean, I've heard what they say about train spotters. What are they going to say about me? Um, so I tried to hide it. I told her, no, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to hide it. I'm, uh, I'm going to fight this. I'm going to fight this. I've got a, I've got a fine family life. They, they're good people. You know. They don't deserve that. <laughs> So I tried to fight it, but it kept creeping out. You know, they caught me going to air shows. And what are you doing? Nothing, nothing. nothing. Um, <laughs> They caught me, you know, I'd say, hey, kids, you know, have you ever wondered why a plane, how it flies? No. You know, well, I'm driving along at 50 miles an hour. Why in the wind today? If you put your hand out, you'll feel the air resistance, you know. I think my wife's comment about oncoming traffic and the fact our kids had enough arms already um, put paid to that. But, I, you know, I thought, oh, I, I, you know what I've got to do? I've got to go and learn to fly. I've just got to face, I've just got to face this. So I did. I started flying lessons. And um, I figured if we're going to do it properly, Everybody had to get something out of it. So my family got to sit um, by a swimming pool on sun loungers with drinks and an air-conditioned villa, and I got to sit in a tin box at 45 degrees heat on the runway in Cyprus. And I was sitting there um, thinking, OK, here we go, here we go. It's only like flight number three. And there's me in one of these, again, an improbably small plane. This was a mini with wings, this one. The runway at Paphos Airport is about four miles long. It's ridiculous. It's about a mile wide. And behind me, because I, I can hear, because I've got the headphones on, is a Russian jumbo jet full of people who want to go home to Russia. They've spent their money. They want to go. And he's whining. You know, his engines are going. 
and I'm running through the flight checks very slowly because, you know, hey, I'm new. I don't want to be the guy who forgot to, the check, you know. Oh, the wing's bolted on. We'll do that one later, you know. Um, so I thought, you know, we've got we to do it properly. So I'm going through it very slowly, and I can hear there's a Ryanair plane trying to come in as well, and they're just about to press another Ryanair flight that landed on time. And he said, no, don't, don't. There's some idiot on the runway still. The Russian is at this point, he's already, I can hear it. I know what he's saying in Russian. I don't speak Russian, but he's saying, do you reckon we could just run over that guy? And would anybody notice? So, you know, I said, right, I think I've done the check. So my instructor said, okay, you can take it off. I said, what? I wasn't expecting that. He said, you can take it off. I said, I don't think I can. He said, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. What you do is you put full power on, you keep it dead straight, and when it gets to a certain speed, you lift the nose. And the physics does the rest. Thought, oh, my word. Okay, I'll do that. And it was exactly what he said. That's what happened. I thought, this is unbelievable. And, uh, you know, I think that it, sort of if it was my brush with science, people do this. Millions of people do this every day. They get in in probably large tin boxes and go through the sky and come out the other end, and most of them without even realizing how extraordinary that is. So, you know, in summary... Um, wh you know, where did I go? Well, wh am I? Do I regret the fact I didn't do it for a career? No, because friends of mine did, and as they say to me, "Hey, I drive a big bus or a taxi." You know, I, I do it for British Airways, and I start in London, I end in Kazakhstan, but I still, you know, drive a big bus full of people or freight or whatever, plastic dog poos or whatever you know from from Hong Kong or whatever. Um, so, I mean, doing it for fun, I think, was you know, I came around full circle. I think that was the right thing to do in the end. Um, I haven't finished my my flying training. Um, what will I do when I do? Well, I, I'll just keep it for fun. But I've got one thought in my head, and that, you know, I, knew, I, I know as a nerd how many Spitfires were made, 26,000. I know how many still fly, roughly, give or take a few, dozens, surprisingly. And actually, I also know that a couple of those have two seats, two sets of controls. And if you're very nice to the people that own them, and you pay, of course, and get on the list, um, you can go flying in one of those. So you can actually fly the Spitfire I always wanted to fly. Uh, thankfully, nobody would be shooting at me, but hey, who, you never know, I might be that bad. But <laughs> um, so, so call me back in about five years, and, uh, and I'll let you know what it was like. But thank you. <laughs> That was Julian Parker. Growing up in an army family, Julian failed to resist the urge to follow in his father's footsteps. But after a short but brilliant military career, he stumbled into the world of corporate investigation, where he has successfully managed to avoid being found out for over 20 years. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to October Gallery for hosting the show, to the Inside Out Festival, and to Heights for being terrifying. Really. Thanks for listening. Everybody in your crew identifies as either Big Mac Burger, McNuggets, or McCrispy Sandwich. But you're the filet fish Sandwich all day. That crispy fish, that savory tartar sauce, that melty cheese, that pillowy bun. Yeah, you get it. Every time. And if you love the filet fish right now you can catch two of the classics you love for just $6. Limited time only. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.